Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're diving into one of the quirkiest and most fascinating chapters in Russian aviation history, the Yak-38, the Soviet Union's ambitious attempt at VTOL jump jets. Now you've heard of the legendary Harrier, but what about its Soviet cousin that, well, let's just say it didn't quite stick the landing in the long term. From its revolutionary design to its laugh out loud mishaps, we're breaking down why the Yak-38 became a flying experiment with more drama than action. Trust me, this is one aircraft that you're going to want to hear about. But before we jump into it, I do have a question for you. What is your own favorite jump jet aircraft and why? Let me know in the comment section below. Personally, mine, of course, is the Harrier jump jet. Not because it's just a legend, but because of its incredible role in the Falklands War. Having served in the British Army and being posted to the Falkland Islands myself, I saw firsthand how vital naval aviation and VTOL aircraft can be in battle. Now let's dive into the story of its Soviet counterpart. This one's going to be fun. So what was the Soviet answer to the Harrier? How did the Yak-38 really come to either try and mostly fail to become its counterpart? Well, the British Harrier burst onto the scene in the 1960s. The Soviets had to respond because what's a Cold War without an arms race in the skies? particularly at sea, enter the Yak-38, NATO codename Forger, the Soviet Union's very own VTOL jump jet, and it had a lot of trials and tribulations to get going. It was meant to project Soviet power from a heavy aviation cruiser standpoint, essentially a hybrid aircraft carrier, bold in vision, clunky though in execution. The Yak-38 was no clean sheet marvel like the Harrier, and to be honest, the Harrier wasn't really either. It emerged from the Yak-36 demonstrator, which had all the charm of a flying science experiment. By the time the Yak-38 was operational, it was plagued with compromises. Short range, check. Weak armament, double check. Its VTOL lift jets guzzled fuel like there was no tomorrow, leaving it with a range of about two hundred miles, and this is hardly strategic in a naval configuration. Unlike the Harrier, which enjoyed Hollywood stardom from battlefield fame, the Yak-38 felt like an overzealous interim trying to impress in a meeting. Yes, it could take off vertically, but reliability issues and limited payload meant it was more of just a show than actual substance. In the end, while the Harrier soared, the Yak-38 hovered into obscurity, a reminder that sometimes imitation isn't the sincerest form of flattery. <coughs> China. The Yak-38 engineering can only be described as just truly ambitious, though. It's slightly unhinged, but ambitious. Designed to leap vertically into the skies for Soviet carriers, it relied on a trio of engines, a primary Suez R-28 for forward propulsion, and two Yabinks RD-36 lift jets for vertical takeoff. The result? A technological juggling act that left the pilots praying that their flight would turn into a spinning disaster. One standout feature was its, quote, smart ejection seat, designed to automatically jettison the pilot if the aircraft tilted too far from during liftoff. Brilliant on paper, hilarious in practice, this mechanism became infamous for ejecting pilots during minor hiccups, effectively turning minor mechanical errors into high-altitude comedy sketches. And no offense to the pilots, I'm sure it's terrifying, but wow. Then there was the Yak-38's ability to kick up dirt and debris during takeoff, threatening its own engines and anyone unlucky enough to be nearby. Add to that its laughably limited range and lack of radar, you've got a jet that felt more like a high-maintenance diva than a combat-ready workhorse. For all of its faults, though, the Yak-38 did try and showcase the Soviets' willingness to experiment, and I have to give a bit of a round of applause for them. They tried, they pushed hard for this. It may have not hit the mark, but it left behind some really valuable lessons of what not to do with VTOL technology. But remember, it's not just at sea these aircraft were being utilized. They could be used in ground battles as well. If the Yak-38 had a motto, it might have been not built for the battlefield, but we'll try anyway. Deployed briefly during the Soviet-Afghan War, the Yak-38's foray into combat was as thrilling as a paper plane competition. With the range barely stretching 200 miles, these jets were more likely to run out of fuel than actually reach the enemy. Then became, as I'd mentioned before, the infamous debris problem. In Afghanistan's extremely rugged terrain and dust-bound terrain, which I first and foremost have actually dealt with, the powder and sand there is like baby powder, like talcum powder. The VTOL system kicked up so much cloud of dust and rocks, it clogged up the engines and actually endangered its ground crews trying to set up the forward operating bases for these jets. Picture a fighter jet turning every takeoff into a localized sandstorm, hardly ideal for efficiency or stealth of positions when they're trying to take off. Its weapon loadout didn't really help either. It could only carry a modest 4,400 pounds of ordnance, but without radar it was like sending a knight into battle with a blindfold and a butter knife. 
these jets conducted 12 sorties during its Afghan stint and yielded no notable achievements, solidifying its reputation as an over-engineered novelty. Unlike the United States, the Soviet Union focused on being a land power and its navy was structured around supporting continental defence rather than global power projection. This philosophy extended to its approach to aircraft carriers. Instead of large single-purpose carriers akin to those of the US Navy, the Soviets deployed heavy aviation cruisers that I mentioned before that combined the firepower of battleships with the modest flight deck for limited aircraft operations. These ships, such as the Kiev class, necessitated a VTOL fighter to complement their hybrid design. The Yakolov Design Bureau was tasked with developing this fighter, and that work began in the 1960s, as I had mentioned leading to the experimental Yak-36 freehand. This technology demonstrated proved critical insights, but highlighted the challenges of creating a combat-capable VTOL aircraft. And by 1976, the Yak-38 emerged, but was really not destined to stay very long for the Soviet Kiev class carriers. The Yak-38's fuselage was slim, with short wings equipped with two hardpoints per wing. Other notable design aspects included folding wings, essential for carry operations, and these reduced the aircraft's footprint on deck. It had no internal gun. The Yak-38 relied entirely on external hardpoints for its armament. For its payload of a maximum of 4,400 pounds, it could carry the KH-23 air-to-surface missiles, R-60 air-to-air missiles, or unguided rockets, but its firepower was significantly inferior to its contemporaries. Truly though, its operational capabilities were so limited to that range and endurance, and the VTOL operations that were given to this aircraft just did not apply. And the avionics, the absence of a radar rendered it unsuitable for air superiority missions or beyond visual range engagements. It was basically a jet plane with no ability to even know what's coming. It did have some reported advantages though. Not a huge amount, but some. In terms of reconnaissance, this aircraft was very useful protecting the fleet from long distance engagements. It could notify the fleet of when jets or other aircraft were in the area from visual range and particularly ships, but you would have to be a very good pilot with extremely good eyesight to identify aircraft from a long distance. More notably though, this was very useful at detecting submarines or ships at sea that were breaking the, I guess, waves if you're a submarine and a ship that's in some form of flotilla or fleet that's coming towards your own fleet. So, you're spending a lot of money for a reconnaissance jet when, in essence, you could just spend the same amount of money on more effective helicopters that would do the same thing with better range. The Yak-38 did mark the Soviet Union's first and only fully operational VTOL aircraft, and efforts to develop an advanced successor, the Yak-41 Freestyle, which I have done a video on, showed promise, but were abandoned following the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the Yak-38 thus remains a testament to the challenges of VTOL technology during its formative years. While the Harrier became a symbol of ingenuity and adaptability, the Yak-38 unfortunately is remembered as an ambitious but flawed experiment. Its shortcomings really underscore the difficulties of balancing the engineering demands of VTOL systems with the practical military requirements. There was a total of 143 of these units produced. To help Soviets train naval pilots in the intricacies of VTOL flight, the Forger was evolved into a dedicated two-seat training form in the Yak-38U NATO Forger B. The fuselage was lengthened to accept the second cockpit and the model entered service on November 15th, 1978 with 38 examples following in production. After some time in service, the Yak-38 family was modernized to produce the Yak-38M Forger A designation. A Tomunsky R-28 V300 vectored thrust and Rabinsk RD-38 engine combination replaced the original pairing for forward propulsion lift thrust respectively. The added power increase of the design's maximum takeoff weight by over 2,000 pounds led to reinforced underwing hardpoints for greater carrier war loads. The intake openings were revised for new engine fit and the product came online in June 1985 and 50 examples were produced. There existed several unofficial forger offshoots during its operational history as well as the Yak-36P which was intended for supersonic fighter jets as the Yak-38MP was to carry the advanced navigation and attack suite of the Mokayan MiG-29 Fulcrum fighter series. The Yak-39 was projected as a multi-role platform but joined the others in the Soviet aviation history as an abandoned project. In summary, the Yak-38's impact on aviation history can be best summed up as brief, albeit humorous, footnote. It was an aircraft that really did capture the imagination of Soviet engineers and kept the West on their toes. They were very eager to develop a VTOL for their jets in the Navy, but ultimately the Forger was a flight of fancy that struggled really to get off the ground literally 
and figuratively. In its short career, the AK-38 was never able to perform as its designers intended, and spending more money and time into trying to get this aircraft to work was completely flawed, particularly when the Soviet Union collapsed. Though it was retired from service, the Yak-38 is still remembered by many aviation enthusiasts for its sheer audacity and relentless optimism behind its development. It may have been a tactical disappointment, but it was fascinating as an experiment nonetheless for Soviet aviation. Its failures really underscored the challenges of integrating VTOL capabilities into combat-ready platforms and highlighted key areas for improvement for the future. For one, the aircraft demonstrated the inefficiency of using multiple engines for lift and thrust. Modern VTOL engines such as the Lockheed Martin F-35B rely on a single engine system with advanced thrust vectoring, simplifying operation and fuel efficiency. The Forge's limited payload and lack of radar also taught an important lesson. VTOL aircraft need to be more than just versatile and bounce all over a place. If they cannot do the job when they're in the air, there's absolutely no point in investing in an aircraft and a frame that can just get it off the ground. Additionally, those trials in Afghanistan highlighted the need for a very robust design capable of withstanding harsh environment conditions on both the aircraft carrier decks and on the ground in the battlefield. I have to admit though, I do really love the fact that the Soviet Union pushed hard in its jump jet experiments. You know, the Harrier is an absolutely incredible jet, but at its time of development, you've got to remember that it had an international standpoint of engineering support, uh, not just British. I mean, we always accredit the Harrier to just purely British engineering and, and ingenuity, but of course, we all know that it's not the case. Uh, the Russians did the Yak-38 on their own. They were really pushing the boundaries of their engineering capabilities at the time, and said, let's just do this. Let's see what we can come up with. Uh, and they had a really good go at it. I think if they could have mastered a single engine design and the thrust vectoring more heavily, this could have been a success story. We could have been looking at the Soviet or Russian Harrier jump jet of its time. And look, let's be pretty clear here. You know, aircraft carriers and, you know, naval aviation is not a priority in, in Russian doctrine. It's just not. Um, older aircraft carriers still exist for the Russian fleet. Uh, they're not looking at large-scale aircraft carriers with jump jets, etc. Um, they do have naval aircraft carriers, but they're launching old-school MiGs off there, you know, and, and they're not designed to be utilized in that kind of configuration. They were never primarily designed for the fleet, but they are working with what they have, and it's, uh, it's respectful in that sense to see uh, aviation designers say, you know what, we're going to kind of avoid this project again. Uh, we're going to focus on other areas of our naval capability and naval aviation. And, you know, jump jets and VTOLs, just not the way they want to go. I personally think the VTOL aircraft are an absolutely huge game changer, particularly, as I'd mentioned, during the Falklands War. If it wasn't for Harrier, we would not have won that war. Um, and, and seeing, you know, the battlefield tours that I went on and seeing the environments, the terrain of which those Harriers were punching through, uh, it's scary stuff. I mean, it's incredible, the pilots heroism pushing into some of those environments, particularly uh, what the Argentinians were trying to uh, engage them with. But uh, for the Yak-38 in Afghanistan, I don't think it made a huge amount of um, sense to have the aircraft engaging in Afghanistan because they had Air Force bases, they had bases that could launch aircraft that were more, I guess, suitable for environments like Afghanistan, where you have runways, you have dedicated fleets of aircraft that are designed to do ground bombing runs because you're not engaging, obviously, the Taliban in aircraft. Um, but it was, again, an ambitious attempt to utilize this aircraft in an environment where maybe you don't need radar, you just want close air support. This could have kind of filled that void. But again, those double engines is causing a lot of chaos uh, on the ground when you're working in Afghanistan. Those dust storms are nasty, and you do not want VTOL aircraft filling up with dust, or you're just going to crash to the ground pretty quickly. You have no real capability of uh, being able to land effectively on a runway if it doesn't exist. So something to consider when you're trying to capitalize on VTOL is if you want to use them on an aircraft carrier, so be it. But on a ground configuration, yeah, you better believe that it needs to land on the ground if it needs to. So that's that, the story of the Yak-38, a plane that dared to dream big, but maybe should have stayed grounded. What do you think, though? I'd love to hear your opinion. Was it an engineering marvel ahead of its time, or just a Soviet science project gone wrong? Put it in the comment section below. You know I love talking to you guys and kind of listening to your own inputs, particularly in the feedback of this video. Don't forget to hit that like button. I know you'll get super angry when I say it, but it really does help me get my videos showcased a little bit more with that algorithm. If you enjoyed it, of course, subscribe for some more fascinating aviation stories from the past, present, and future. And until next time, stay curious, stay passionate. If I haven't uh, 
got another video out to you before the Christmas time and holiday season. Have a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Keep those afterburners lit and I'll see you in the next video. All the best, folks. Bye-bye.